have your exams back yet. Uh, <laughs> how, how do you, I was going to say how do you like it, but who likes an exam? How, do, how was the experience? It could be 10 was the best experience you've ever had and, and 0 was one of my typical exams. So um, it, w it should have been not too bad. 7.5. 7.5. That's, that's a winner on my scale. <laughs> no one else agrees, I don't think. But um, All right. So um, I know you don't like to hear this, but the average really isn't that critical because um, I'm going to grade on a curve anyway. So I tried to make it, so I thought it was pretty straightforward. Um, always get overzealous and it ends up being a little longer than I expect, but um, that's just because my enthusiasm. Um. All right, so you have a homework due tomorrow, and uh, it's it's I think pretty easy. Um, I'm assuming the uh, TAs are running a help session thing tonight, but they're not. Oh. Uh. Oh well. Um, Anyway, it's just a single problem. I don't think it's, it's, I don't think it's very difficult. It's based on this material I'm going to cover today. So if you like this material, you'll like the homework. Otherwise, maybe not. Okay. So um, we've started the second part of the course now, which is linear algebra. Statistics is now behind us, except for the final exam. Um, but it's not, we're not going to talk about it until then. So now we're talking about linear algebra. And um, the last part of the course will be on differential equations, which by the time I do differential equations, I'm hoping you know what a differential equation is. Apparently, you already know what a differential equation is to some extent. So, um, so the, the differential equation material builds a lot on the linear algebra material, which is important in its own right. So that's why you're supposed to be interested. I mean, that's not quite. All right. So now we're going to start a series of several lectures that talk about basically how to solve sets of linear algebraic equations, okay? I'll teach you several methods how to solve them analytically, and then I'll teach you how to solve them in MATLAB. And you'll much prefer the MATLAB method, as I'm, I'm sure you'll find out. So I'm going to um, introduce the idea of linear algebraic equation systems today. Then I'll talk about a particular method to solve this called Gauss elimination. Um, and when I get there, I'll explain what it is. It's kind of hard. I'm going to go through a series of three examples explaining how to apply this method and also pointing out what problems might occur in this method, which are general problems of solving these kind of equations, not specific to this method really, although the method reveals them. Um, I'll talk, last time you may not remember this because it was, um, Last, a week ago, I talked about something called the rank of a matrix, and so I'll reintroduce that concept and explain it in the concept of this Gauss elimination. And then I'll start talking about, for the first time in the class, something about numerics. So when uh, we solve problems on the computer, um, my experience as students' assumption is that they, if they get an answer, it's correct, <laughs> okay? Um, and so sometimes problems become difficult to solve even on a computer because they, they have numerical problems associated with them, like very, dividing by very small numbers and things like this, okay? And these problems become much more prevalent when the problems get more complex and larger. So throughout the course, especially when we talk about differential equations, but also here to some extent, I'll start talking about some of these problems that can occur. Um, and so when you're solving these kind of problems in MATLAB, this is manifested by MATLAB giving you a little message saying, I'm concerned about your problem. I think, I'm, I'm not sure I believe my own solution. Something along these lines, okay? So um, we'll cover that at the end. Okay, so um, linear algebraic equations. So I think I presented this notation before, but in case I didn't, I'll do it again. So we have a set of linear algebraic equations here. So x's are the unknowns. And the A's are constant coefficients, we know those, and B are also coefficients, we know those, okay? So this, the, here's an, this is the general case. Here's an example of the kind of thing I'm talking about, right? These coefficients 2 and minus 3 in this equation, and minus 1 and minus 2 are the A's. Uh, the 3 and the 6 are the B's, and the X's are the unknowns. So that's two equations and two unknowns. Anybody can solve that one, I hope, all right? 
This is the general formulation. So we're going to have, um, generally speaking, we're going to have n equations. Okay, well this is square system, okay. Squ when I say square, I mean we have the same number of equations as unknown. You might ask, when does it ever make sense to talk about anything else? And I'll, I'll explain that to you later. But for now, I'll talk, focus on systems that are square. It means we have n equations, right? This index here is the number of equations. And then we have n unknowns. Okay, so this is the first equation. It, in principle, will involve all the unknowns. Sometimes it doesn't involve all the unknowns, but in general it will involve all the x's. Again, we know all these coefficients. The notation here for the coefficients is the first index represents what row you're in, or at this point I should say what equation. Okay, so this means first equation, right? All the coefficients in this equation have one for the first index, meaning the first equation. The second index here represents what variable it multiplies. So one, one, first equation, first variable, one, two, first equation, second variable, so on and so forth. Okay? This is going to be convenient to, to put them, you know, this is a more convenient way than calling this A, B, C, D, right? Because you never know when you'll end. So we give them these subscripts. So the last coefficient here, first equation, nth variable. So we have n variables here, and we also have n equations, okay? And we would like to know how to solve a system of equations like this. So again, if you have something that's really simple like this, it's easy to solve, right? Because you're just going to solve one of these equations for x1 and x2 and substitute it back in the other equation and get the answer. The problem with that kind of calculation is not scalable meaning it doesn't apply well when you get a large number of equations. If I give you 10 equations and 10 unknowns, this would be a nightmare to sub write, substitute back in. And it would also be fraught with error. So we're looking for methods that are um, more efficient, more systematic, and also will, are amenable to like putting on a computer for numerical solution. So this becomes cumbersome to write the equation like this, and this, sca this is a scalar form, meaning everything's just a scalar. So we prefer to write it in this vector kind of notation, which we introduced last time. We've been doing it in MATLAB anyway, but we introduced the idea of vectors and matrices last time. So rather than write this cumbersome thing here, I'd much prefer to write it like this, okay? A here is a matrix, X is a vector, and B is also a vector. So x is the vector of unknowns. So we have n unknowns, we just take those unknowns and stack them in a column vector called boldface x. So the notation should be if I tell you something's boldface, it means it's a matrix or a vector. Sometimes I make mistakes and I don't do it, but that's what it's supposed to be. So there's a vector x with components x1, x2, all the way down to the last one, xn. b is a vector. Again, you just take all these coefficients on the right-hand side of these equations stick them into a ve column vector and call that column vector B, okay? So if I say, what is the second component of the vector B? It's B2, all right? And then for the matrix A, what we do is take all the coefficients from this set of equations and put them in the matrix A. So the first row is all the coefficients for the first equation in order, right? 1, 1, 1, 2, so on and so forth. Second row is the um, coefficients for the second equation, so on and so forth, okay? So when we look at this matrix A, we'll say each row corresponds to an equation, right? Each column um, corresponds to an unknown because if you look at this first column, you'll notice those are all the coefficients that multiply x1. Those are all the coefficients that multiply x2, okay? So rows, equations, columns, unknowns. All right. Now, for this little example up there, this is quite easy to do. So if I want to write it in vector matrix form, of course I don't know what it is. What is it, three and six? And the coefficients are 2 and minus 3 for the first equation and minus 1 and minus 2 for the second equation. Okay? All right. Usually capital letters mean matrices and lowercase boldface letters mean vectors, but not always. <laughs> All right. All right. So that's nice. It's very convenient, right? I'd much rather write this like this. 
Of course, in order to write this like this, I have to know something about the dimension of the matrix A, right? If I tell you the dimension of the matrix A, there's nothing else that you need to know. So I'll often write this like this. Okay, that, that's saying R is an n by n matrix. It has n rows and n columns, and all the entries are real numbers. Okay? So correspondingly, we can write that X is a vector n. It's just, right, a column vector, and same thing with B. So if you see this kind of notation, all I'm trying to tell you is what the dimension of things are. And we're always dealing with real numbers. We're dealing with complex numbers. Okay? So the R is kind of... It's fine, it just says everything's real. The key thing is, is this a matrix or a vector? And if so, what's the dimension? Okay? All right. So if I give you this, if I give you this right here, and then I tell you this right here, then that's equivalent to all those equations up there, right? Just a much more efficient way of writing it. All right. Now, you guys in differential equations, have you, you've heard the term, I assume, at this point, homogeneous for differential equations? Okay. So the same kind of thing applies to algebraic equations. So this vector B is zero, and you notice when I say zero, I have a, I have a bold phase zero, because B is a vector, so by saying B is zero, I mean it's a vector of zeros, so I indicate bold phase. <coughs> um, so that's called homogeneous linear system. So if that's the case, then you've got AX equals zero. I feel like writing on the board today, I'm not sure what's wrong with me. Um, all right, so that's called homogeneous linear system. And one solution to this set of equations is obvious, right? X equals zero solves that equation for sure, X be being the zero vector, okay? Now, whether there's additional solutions beyond X equals zero depends on something on the properties of the matrix A, which we'll talk about. All right? Okay, so let's say we are fortunate that our system of equations looks like this. So this is a three by three system. Three equations, three unknowns. There's the matrix A, there's our unknown vector, and here's our B vector, okay? And what makes this problem nice is it's triangular. We introduced this concept, um, I guess, a week ago. So triangular matrix means if you draw a line that, along the diagonal, <coughs> all the elements above the diagonal or below the diagonal are all zero. So in this case, it's called a lower triangular matrix because all the entries above the diagonal are zero, okay? Triangular matrices are nice for the following reason. My neck already hurts. I was thinking about doing this, but this isn't really very professional, is it? Um, all right, so we look at this equation, set of equations, and you'll notice this triangular structure is quite convenient because if you were to take this first equation, right? The first equation is generated by multiplying this row times that column. So that gives you 2x1, right? Because these other entries are zero. So that gives you 2x1 equals four. That's what I wrote right there. And that's easy to solve for x1, obviously. So that's nice, now I know x1. Now if I take this other, this next equation here, I can multiply this row times this column, set it equal to three to get the second equation. And that's gonna be x1 minus x2 plus zero x3. So that's that equation right there. And since I already know x1, I can solve this one for x2, right? And this is not complex math, right? Just solve this equation for x2, plug in your value for x1, you find um, x2 is minus one. And now I'm in good shape because now I have one equation and one unknown. And <coughs> you can generate this equation by multiplying this row times this column, right? And that gives you this right here. Set that equal to one. Now solve this equation for x3 in terms of x1 and x2. You just trust me on this one. Just algebra, right? I say that a lot in this class or any class I teach. It doesn't work well when my son comes home with algebra homework. I'm just like, just algebra, just do it. I mean, <laughs> like English is hard, right? There's more than one answer, but algebra, there's only one answer. What's the problem? Just find it. It's right there, all right? Plug in x1, x2 into this equation. There they are. You'll find it's equal to one. So that's great. So if all our system of equations look like that, they'd be easy to solve. That's called back substitution, right? So this process of Gaussian elimination is meant to take a system of arbitrary structure. So normally the A matrix is not going to look like this, right? It's going to have all these entries might be non-zero. So what Gaussian elimination does is take any matrix A and turn it into a triangular matrix that looks like that. 
Okay. Once you get a triangular matrix that looks like that, you can find the solution by back substitution, just like I did for this example. So obviously, once we have it in this form, we know what to do. The question is how to get it in this form in the first place. And so the idea is that we're going to do this using so-called elementary row operations, which I'll explain in a minute, I hope. Yes, I do. The reason we're going to operate on the rows is because each row represents an equation. Okay? And I'll explain that on the next slide. So again, the goal is take any problem that looks like AX equals B, no matter what the matrix A looks like, and convert that into a problem where the A matrix is um, diagonal, or sorry, triangular. All right, so we're going to do this as follows. So if you have a system that looks like AX equals B, you're going to form something called the augmented matrix. So you're going to take the matrix A and you're going to augment it with the B as the last column. So in other words, all the col we just have A here. This is the A matrix, and then the last column is the B vector. That's called the augmented matrix. And so here's what we're going to do. So hopefully you understand that each row of this represents an equation, right? That's the first equation, that's the second equation, that's the last equation, and so on. Okay? We're going to take this guy. It looks like I've changed... <coughs> well, in this case, you can see I've changed my notation of pad, even though I didn't mean to probably, is that now the number of equations is M and the number of unknowns is N. On the previous thing, they were equal to each other and they were both equal to N. So I didn't really mean that at this point. So I'll probably go back and change this, but this is supposed to be same number of equations as unknowns right now. So N, just pretend M is N for now.